and retreat in your wonderful name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yeah, the stuff of the human heart. Huh? Time for the Lord's Prayer. I'm thinking mum and dad will be in here in a sec. I'm thinking about, I was thinking we would have Joy and Leon here to start with the tears. I thought, well, I'll take a minute to just recap. We'll tell us how it's very but just recap Sacred Circle and what exactly it is that we're gathering to do and how that works. It took a number of years, but we wanted to make the word, we all it's in a sense available, to open it up and make it available for people. And to me, it seemed like the most obvious way to do that would be to give people the keys. That might actually be Shannon. Who remembers Shannon from last week? No, it's not. So, with my son, I'm not sure yet. And so it made sense to me as I sort of thought about this challenge. You know, the Word of God is, is written on these multiple levels and it's meant to open up and reveal our soul and our relationship with the divine. But it's been deliberately written in that hidden code, that spiritual language, and you think, but why? Why would God do that, you know? And again, the most simple answer is, why do we wear clothes? Why do we wear clothes? There's a protective element. There's taking what is sacred and hiding it. You know, the, 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 our, our sexual organs are our most sacred, highest organs. And it's touch, it's love, it's all that. But we, we cover that. And the, the Lord has covered the most secret things, but still allow them to be available I mean, it says that he did not teach without using parables. And so even though the word has a literal side to it, there's a literal history in there, it's true, deeper messages, eternal messages written in those parables in that language. So I thought, well, if we're going to do this, and, and we put together this text here, which is unlocking the power of sacred text, it's all 40-plus parables of Jesus. Unpacked. We're going to need another chair, not at all. Good morning, Dr. Tom. Come on, come on in, come on in. Grab a seat. We haven't even said the Lord's Prayer yet, so it's a good timing. Uh, so, we, so we put this, the 40 parables of Jesus into breaking down the spiritual sense with some practical application, which is what we do one in a sacred circle. But even more important than that is that these 40 parables have also been as best, and I've got Ian's help to do this prayerfully, to take these 40 parables and try to move them into groups that help us understand the seven days of creation. We all know the seven days of creation. God created light, 
Then he separated the waters above from the waters below. So we think of that as oceans and clouds or sky. Then he created new earth. Then he created the sun, stars, and moon. Then there is an abundance. The earth fills an abundance. Day six is the day of the warm-blooded animals, man and the warm-blooded animals. And then day seven is the day of rest. And they correspond to when you have a, a lightning, an enlightening moment in your life, sacred text comes alive and you go, oh, why have I never seen that before? That's a light moment. Then you learn to separate from your ego, your lower self and your higher self. That's day two. The stormy oceans or waters below, which threaten to drown you, think Noah's Ark, drown you, you learn to rise up out of them into the space in between called heaven. And Buddhists do a lot of this work in day two. But they probably don't think of the other days in there, but we, we, we want to look at all of that. So I put these parables into these days to try and help us work with that. So day three, earth comes up out of the water, so that's a new engagement. You're now re-engaged, you're just chopping wood, carrying water like you always did, but now you've got an enlightened aspect to what you're doing, you're able to bring love into what you're doing. Day four is where you get a special eating. That's sun, moon, and stars, the seasons. So, you know, the, the, you see numbers repeating as well. Though. Or you hear the same word over here, and you know, oh, I'm being tapped on the shoulder by God. He's trying to tell me something. So, day five is when we just grow up under Because you cannot do this work without just multiplying and prospering, both in mind, soul, and in the external world. You multiply. Because as your soul changes, the external world changes as well. So then, of course, day six comes, which is the battle. The time of real, the dark night of the soul, where deeper work has to be done. And we come through that, out of the lower self completely, into the higher self, and so we can rest. Day seven, we're now able to rest with God. And that's the seventh day. So we've broken it into here. Today we're looking at the two sons, and we've, with Ian's prayer for help, we lotted this in to day two spiritual work. It's about the third parable into day two spiritual work. And what we're going to find, if you read the parables literally, you'll always be left with this kind of judgment. Oh, I'm the good son, you're the bad son. Or, you're good, and I'm doing bad. But when we get to the deeper spiritual level, we realise all of these things are happening inside us, and that's when the parable really comes to life, when we realise sometimes I'm operating out of the inner self, the one that wants to do God's will, and other times I'm not. And day two, the most important key from day two, when we're going to separate from our ego and see things more clearly as they are, is you come into your first touch of love. You're no longer judging yourself and others. That's so beautiful. So many Christians are stuck in judgment. <clears throat> You're all the bad son, I'm the good one. That's judgment. But when you realise that the parable is actually talking about things going on inside us, it frees you from literally pointing at someone else and going, am I operating from this, the good son, or am I operating from this, the bad son? And we can take that knowledge with us. So I hope that helps explain a little bit more. As we go through these parables, the goal is that you all become equipped with all the keys to unlock the rest of sacred text. Because it is rich. It is so rich. We will spend the rest of this life and beyond having its deeper message unveiled to us. And what we find, get on in guys, grab a couple of chairs, sneak in. Uh, what we find is two things. We transform and then we see God. Who, who would like to see more of God? I know I, I know I do. And then. And so instead of looking at you and seeing uh, externals and judging, I can look at each one of your eyes and see the divine living there inside each one of you. Yeah. <laughs> Good on you, Chris. Thank you, mate. Jennifer just made an incredibly important point. It, it, it's, it's, she said, it's, it's, not, it's not just to see God, it's also to feel God. And you beautifully just identified the difference between day one, two, and three, which is all about light. And, and working with that light. And then even special guidance comes through light, sun, moon, and stars. But then as we move into day five, six, and seven, that's where the emotional side of us develops, the will side of us, and we feel. 
but we also that's why also the, the selfish side that feels like it deserves more than others also gets that's a good point that you make. Okay, so we've laid that found foundation. Now before we get stuck into the reading, how about we let's not stand up, but let's if you can reach each other, let's say the Lord's Prayer. Did you? Good on you, Chris. Thanks, mate. <laughs> Do my job for me. <laughs> Let's, um, Chris, we're going to extend our spiritual hand over. You don't have to. <laughs> Do you want? Okay. Stay, stay seated. Stay seated. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together and, and just bring that atmosphere of heaven home. Yeah. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Have a seat. Whew! Feel that? <laughs> Just the, the peace and all the warmth and all the glow that rushes in when we when we stop and pray together like that. It's good. It's a good way to start start a session. So if, if we go around this way, and oh, I don't mind starting. Do people don't mind reading? If that's okay. We just uh, go around. Let's get into it. Who likes that picture on the front done by Jordan? Isn't that beautiful? So I said, draw me a picture, and she gave me that, and I went, wow. You know, we are the two sons. Actually, think of it this way. You know, again, in the literal sense, talking about raptures or caught up to God and all that, which is really a transformation. Jesus says in that day, there'll be two in the field. One will be taken. There'll be two in the dead. One will be taken. Or there'll be two grinding at the mill and one will be taken. Right now, sitting in the chair that you're sitting in, there's two of you. There's your physical body and there's your spiritual body. There's two, but when the Lord takes you, when you're caught up, one remains, the other is taken away. Isn't that an interesting thought? That's how the language of spirit works in that way. We think two literal people, but the Lord's going, no, you have these two natures, a lower nature and a higher nature. So here we are with the two sons. Let's have a look. The two conflicting natures inside the advancing soul. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and he said, Son, Go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterwards he repented and went. And he came to the second son and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. And went not. Whether of those twain did the will of his father? They said unto him, The first. And Jesus said unto them, Truly I say unto you, that publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and harlots believed him, and yea, when you had seen it, repented not afterwards, that you might believe in him. Did that stand out to anyone in that reading at that time? I mean, we read these things again and again. Did anything jump out to you in that particular reading? How easy is it for a yeah, doctor not? What God looks at is not the body, but the soul. Right. Whether you're a harlot or a mortal of a man or a woman, boy or a girl, God doesn't bother about that. The physical nature, he has no concern for God. Right the soul. So he looks into the soul. Is it, is it pure? Is it towards me? Does the soul love me? So the, the whole the world is the, the world is really really bound by the sin which is bodily functions. Mm -hmm. Sex is a bodily function. So the whole world is beaten towards that path. Mm -hmm. So we judge people based upon the external manifestations of a sinful action. Mm -hmm. But God is not bothered about it, where you do this or that. Do you love me? If you love me, I think that's all it's concerned, which comes out of a soul, which is love. So this, I think, understanding must be made very clear to people. Yeah. Don't judge people by the physical dimensions. 
what you look and what you hear and what you say. But look deeper inside. God works there. And he judges from that point of view. That's powerful. That's good. Yeah, that's good. Uh, anyone else have anything to jump out at them in that reading? That judgment can jump out at me. How easy we are to judge other people and think that they're better. Yeah. Okay. Which is exactly what you're saying. So true. And we can do it the other way too, can't we, Jane? We can really beat ourselves up as well. It doesn't happen so much in the world, but when you start to become a more spiritual person, it is so easy to beat yourself up and go, I'm not good enough. And yet, like Dr. Noll says, I, I love the way even Swedenborg says this, the Lord's not looking at who, who we are, what we've done, where we've been. He's seeing what we're becoming. And, and you know, that's, that, that again is my favourite saying. Sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. Or Isaiah chapter 1 says it this way, you know, though your sins be as red as, as, as crimson or blood, they'll be whiter than the wool. Come let us reason, says the Lord. So it's only when we lift up our thinking into spiritual realities do we realise we're, we're, we're learning lessons or we're not learning lessons. So sometimes we repeat something again and again. Sin, as you say, we repeat it again and again and again because we're not learning the lesson. But the Lord's seeing that moment where whoosh, the sea cracks open and we start to learn. So he sees that moment. Well, who are we becoming? Not, not all of those mistakes that we've made. I heard something recently in some During temptation, if you could picture what was going on, your ego will kind of embrace it but stand back, but if you could picture these spirits, what they were actually doing, men running with fire sticks chasing you, and if you could picture that, you would run, but the ego does it completely different and it goes, hang on, they get me these people. That other side of you, you don't get me. These people get me. But that's maybe changed the way I look at temptation there. I'm seeing these men with fire sticks and spears oh, wow. chasing you now. Yeah. Instead of embracing me, they're actually trying to gorge me. And to take, yeah, trying to take what they can out Possess of Possess you. So I got that, it was only last week, wasn't I? I mean, wow, so temptation, it's a little bit like uh, you're looking at it through rose-coloured glasses as they say but when you separate those two sons you will see these tyrants after you it's not it's not luring you you know what i mean i don't that's know that's really beautiful chris so you know let's just go through day one two and three quick something you there chris you've had an explosion of insight but like you're, you're getting a better perspective on what's really going on and that's teaching you to be more detached day two and then as you work with that, that's day three. You just work with, oh, it's going to happen again. I promise it'll happen again. These fiery stick men will come out to you again. But now you'll see it in that new light. And that's why it's new earth. You know, you're doing the same things, but now you're, doing, you're able to do it with the knowledge, that detached ego, free knowledge. Ego meaning it makes us own things. And this is one of the most amazing passages Spinball wrote. I mean, there's many, but he said, you know, if we could see things as they really were, that evil is flowing in, and good is flowing in, we'd stop taking credit for the good, we'd acknowledge the divine. We're a vessel, we're a cup, but we'd stop owning the evil too. And he says, goes on to say in his own words, the moment we stop owning it, it loses all its power. Because we see that for what it really is, it's not me wanting this, mm. it's actually energy, dark energy seeking to devour me and consume me with their fiery well, stick. Curtis says it this way, he says, when he's driving along and he sees, and he gets a little bit angry at someone, he goes, wow, it, it's angry today. <laughs> Not me, I mean the proprium is angry, it's, it's, it's angry, to, I don't own that anger. Um, That's lovely. It's, it's like... It, it, it is. It's, it's like cutting ownership. It's like, no, 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 no. And it, 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 it is liberating, but you've got to remember it. That's the thing. When <laughs> the heat of the moment. This is another one from David Miller. You know David Miller, right? Mm -hmm. And he says, oh, this is called anger. Oh, this is called depression. Oh, this is called happiness. You know? So it gives us that day two. We step back and we go, oh, we're observing those stormy waters. 
rather than being tossed around in them, we're stepping back, and that's the beauty. I'm glad we're doing this, because this is what, you know, this is a day two parable. So we're sort of going deeper into this ability that we need to exercise to be able to step back and go, oh, because that's all self-awareness is. But again, Swinburne says, he says in his own words, self-awareness is a miracle. Self-awareness is, is, a, is a divine act, is what he says. It's a miracle. Because animals think, animals feel, but they can't exercise self-awareness the way we can. It's, it's an incredible thought, isn't it? One of the gifts of the human form that we have, made in his image and likeness of himself away. So we've got to start working this muscle. Day two is about building this muscle of self-awareness in a non-judgmental way. And the more light we have, and then act on that light, so Chris has gotten some light and he seems to already be working with it, because it's too easy to go, that was cool, and forget about it. And then next week you're in a battle again, being embracing your fiery men. <laughs> yeah, so we've got to work with that light. And the more we work with it, the more we rise up into that space between called heaven. It's so good. So, so today, as we look at the two sons, just realize sometimes we're saying, yes, Lord, not doing it. And other times we're saying, oh, I don't want to do this. But then we moved and we do do it. And, and we're both. Okay, so fantastic stuff. Um, When you win, you lose. When you lose, you win. It's a good reframing, isn't it? Yeah, it's like you know, like we judge that you know, people who are, you know, haven't achieved as much in life or haven't done so much in life, you know, but they're the ones getting into heaven. You know, we're seeing better than those who have overachieved and overdone things because it comes back to the motive. You know, they're doing it for the ego. They're doing it for. I don't know, I'm not making... Anyway, that came no, to me. No, it's great. It's making perfect that. sense. In fact, uh, for, the, for the past two weeks, I've been wanting to put a new heater decor in our Toyota. Because Ivana likes to drive it and it's cold. It doesn't work. I just swapped the pipes over when the heater decor went because it's a big job. And I thought, well, I'll get a quote. And then the guy says, uh, it'll be about 1500 plus. I went, oh. Looked on eBay, the part was 150. It's often the way, isn't it? You know, 10% for the part and 90% for labour. And, and fair, fair enough, it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. I mean, people are charging that for pulling spark plugs out. To, to do it, I had to pull the entire dash. Everything, every, all, all the display, the radio, strip it right back until you could see the firewall. And then pull the crash bar out, and right tucked in there was this little, little tiny radiator. I pulled it out, and put it back in, and put it away very nervously putting, clipping everything together, trying to be as conscientious as I can. Uh, you know, started Friday afternoon, finished yesterday afternoon mostly, enough that I could turn the car on. Airbags weren't flashing, things weren't going off, everything worked except the um, uh, hazard light. Oh, oh, it's working, <laughs> wrong cable. There are so many wires behind it, it's just, oh. But I thought, I'm gonna do this, you know. And, and, and I felt relief. It's all work. Turn the air on, the heater is blowing, there's no water running in the cabin anymore. And then I thought about it. You know, if I was a mechanic and I did this all the time, it'd just be another job. You know, you just do it. And then you make mistakes. Now here I am very nervously trying to get it right. And I think this happens in our spiritual world. <clears throat> we, we discover there's another level to our life and we start doing the spiritual stuff and we're very nervous, we're very anxious, we're hungry, we want to grow and we give a lot of attention to our spiritual life. And then you do it year after year after year and you're like the mechanic that just, yeah, it's just another day. And there are some real powerful tools the enemy has to try and trip us up. Bitterness. You can be doing so well for so long and then somebody does something and you choose to interpret it. There's your you know, winning and losing. You choose to interpret it in a, in a negative way and you get bitter. And then you let your convictions go because of that bitterness. Well, I'll do this. I'll say that. I'll treat them this way. Trust me, there's been affairs. Loving couples have had affairs simply because of bitter moments. So I'll get back at them and you think, what? But this is what the hells do. They, they, they look for a way in. And bitterness is one of them. Fear is another big one. 
complacency is big. It's, it's kind of that analogy with the mechanical, you know. I, I think we should never lose that complacency. Let's try to stay like babes, like children, always hungry. Can we just say a quick prayer if that's all right? Just say, dear Lord, keep me your child, always in wonder, always in gratitude, always acknowledging. Amen. I don't know if any of you chose to do the assignment from last week, but I chose the 30 seconds, every 30 seconds, no, for 30 seconds I'll say a, a Thanksgiving two or three times during the day. And it was great for me. That was really helpful because I just, I, I found my ability to stay acknowledging and connecting just so much easier. It was easy to stop and look at the sun setting or the beautiful weather or my family or that meal and just, just stop and say, thank you. 30 seconds. That really helped me. So I think that this, you know, as we do this spiritual work, we really are in a battle and we don't want the enemy to take any of us out. And so let's stay like children, stay hungry. I've said enough. Would you like to read the introduction? There's always more room for self-examination followed by transformative action. However, when we slip unconsciously into our own hereditary habits, there arises a real danger of playing the hypocrite. We may fool ourselves into thinking that repentance is unnecessary for our spiritual development, but absolutely essential for everyone else. If we lie to ourselves in this way, we will automatically lie to others and thereby reinforce our own inability to discern the errors of our ways. When we are honest and open about our sins, the pathway forward becomes much more obvious as we cease to make a pretense of weakness and shortcomings. From this platform of humility, the process of repentance becomes much more easier and our spiritual lives much more fruitful. It is this fruit of transformation, genuine repentance, that sacred text is often referring to when it speaks of vineyards and wine. In a general or broad sense, vineyards are the archetype for God's people and wine is the power of truth active in their lives. That was lovely. Thoughts, thoughts or comments on that? Any, any thoughts or comments or questions? The one thing that's coming up for me, I was reading the first bit of it about this, is where the guy said, you know, I'm not going to do it. Then later did it. I can't remember when the Lord was delivering me from religion, um, having to do things all the time, you know. Come on in. Come in. So, yeah, like... Start that again, just so... Yes. So the bit where the guy says, I'm not going to do it, you know. <clears throat> Never too late, Jenny. So you're saying it's never too late? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so... How you doing? So the bit uh, where the guy said, I'm not going to do it, yes. but then it said he later he went and did it. Yes. Like when the Lord was delivering me from religion, I used to be the guy who'd always say I'd do it first and then not <laughs> do it. But then I felt the Lord say, look, I love a joyful giver. If you don't want to do it, just be honest. I don't want to do it. And so I didn't start to say no to a lot of things like, you know, good deeds, helping people, I'd just be no, no, no. And then it freed me up in the space that, that the Lord began to change my heart. So I did want to do it, but it was coming from love. Right. And then not out of law and duty and guilt, because there's no condemnation in Christ. So whenever we do things out of guilt, we're actually not doing it in the Lord's love. So you did, that's a good way You're to... actually marching in the enemy's camp. Yeah, and even now today, when I get invited a lot of places, I'll say no straight away as a habit. But then I can change my mind later and I actually realise, oh, I actually do want to do that. Wow, you know? I might practice that. That's really powerful. <laughs> I'll yeah. start with it now and then I'll come yeah. yes. It just gives you that space to do things from your heart, you know. Because once you've said yes. Exactly. And you might find yourself not wanting to do it. Yeah. Oh, and wow. God loves a joyful That's giver. Very powerful, Chris. 
That's good. Well, Jimmy, the oh. ego first and non ego second. Usually, what you represent is always the physical, the ego. But you, see, you lay back and then take a moment pause, just a moment. You don't speak out of ego, the non ego comes in. So, this is where, you know, the problem is always, you know, we, we commit ourselves based upon an ego, the personality, wow. what we are, but the reality is not this. There is something behind which is truth. So, one minute pause, the answer becomes different. But we always go for the first answer, immediate, quick. Dr. Noel, so, I was talking yeah. to Chris on the way in yes. about Viktor Frankl. Yes. We, we know, most of us know Viktor Frankl went into the concentration camps mm -hmm. and had a lot of awakening himself. He, he makes a statement, he says, between action and reaction is a very fine moment of real freedom. Absolutely. This is day one, this is day two. The water's below and the water's above tossed about by the waters, and we're learning to rise up, like you say, and just pause in that space between. And so we're not operating out of ego, and then the gentle rain of heaven can give, because heaven is very quiet. Hell is very loud. So you get up that space, and then the gentle cloud rain dew can start to give you the answer that we're looking for. It's very wise. Let's stop taking the first thing that pops into our head. <laughs> pause for a moment. Get into that space and then let other answers come into it. That's nice. Yeah. That's cool. What I find interesting is when you see somebody that they're going through this process, they're not a spiritual or person whatsoever, but they tell you what's going on with you. I, I've changed. I, I seem to be looking in myself more. And it's such a good feeling. Because they're growing but not... They're growing good fruit but they're not knowing they're doing it. Yeah. And you can't say to them from our point of view here and say, this is what's going on. But you can actually see the growth. And exactly like you're saying here is happening. Like I've seen some massive transformations of people that like have spent time in prison. And a man that uh, my mate's father, he spent time in and out of prison. He pulled me aside a couple of months ago in front of everyone, he said, look, I had this dream. This, this man's very hard, very hard. I mean, Boggo Road jail in and out when he was younger. Oh. And out of everyone there, he said, I had this dream. And I looked into a tree. It looked like a mango tree. Thousands of angels coming through. Thousands. Whoa. One stood there and he stood. This is a dream he had. And he said, You'll be fine, son. Everything's going to be fine. Wow. Keep going. It's what's your name? I'm Michael. Wow. Then he said to me, I spoke to my circle of Catholic friends, oh. my Anglican friends, and they were all saying how Michael, this guy, if you met him and saw him, he would, he was, ever since then, I had this peace. So I've had to tell my friends and my brother, I said, well, Rusty pulled me aside and told me, that's not Rusty. Rusty doesn't talk like that. <laughs> Rusty, oh, we talk about beer, football, cars. It's not Rusty with me. He pulls me aside and talks about that stuff. rustiness away and you'll find this precious <laughs> metal under there. Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> he is so beautiful. Yeah. He just did a sign for my brother's bar. My brother, that he's right into his brewery's his own beer, and he did this sign. And this is his way of loving and yeah. giving. And, yeah. and they just don't believe me that Rusty told me this, but it's fair dinkum, and he was just opening up But Chris, to me. I mean, it's, it's right here, isn't it? You know, the religious thinking, the re ego thinking, you know, the ego thinking says, you know, I'm in. But Jesus, hang on. Publicans and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. You know, because it's not, it's not about the externals. It, it, it's about that inner growth. You, 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 Michael, right? Michael is those who fight for good and truth. Us. Anyone that's engaging in spiritual practice to make to change their life, to try and make the world a better place, is belongs to Michael, that, that, that group, the spiritual society in heaven called Michael. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. So of all the angels that spoke to him, it was the angel coming and saying, 
keep fighting. You're doing well. This and is how this is how you do it. He's the most charitable person, I tell you. He's wow. rough around the edges. Every second word I can't repeat. But <laughs> heart. and you look into his eyes, his beautiful soul. Wow. But other people can't see that. They see they see Rusty as this tough blokey bloke. But it depends who he's talking to. He's not going to talk to you know his pub mates about his experience with me. I felt really flattered that he opened up to me. Oh. I don't know why. I, I think it, I think there's something we're reading each other a bit. But then Jane said, "Does he know you go to church?" I don't know whether he. Go. I think they may have spoken and said, "Oh, Chris goes to church now," and, and he felt comfortable. Talk. I don't know, but getting people to believe me. But he's a perfect example, and I've never seen this look on Rusty's face before. It was just this acknowledgement. Ah, oh, acknowledgement. He was saying, "This is because he's the last one of his siblings." He's the last one alive. He's got no parents. He's the last one. Oh, there's something there. I had this dream. And if, if, I tell you what, if the Lord can reach someone like Rusty, oh. he can reach anyone. There's hope for me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go on, Chris, read us some more. Where, where, where are we up to? Did anybody else want to say well, anything? I just wanted to say yeah. that I think in Christian circles, the difficulty is that we're supposed to be presenting that, you know, Perfection. shiny, perfect yeah. thing. And, yeah, I think that's sort of, in a way, that's worse than, than yeah, people just living, well, their, the the, living their life. Or you, or you get under the yeah. hood of a car or you do some, you get out in your best clothes. You know, mm. like it, 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 it's about time that spiritual people can, can put on the overalls and do the work and not have to feel... <laughs> And not have to feel like they've got to put on a pretense of perfection. It, 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 it's true, you know. The, 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 the world puts this on us too, yep. Jane. The world says, well, you're supposed to be a Christian. You know, come on, perfection. I want to see perfection. But it's about growth. And one of the things I learned working with children, it's called distance travel. You don't look at the child's behaviour. You, you look at the distance that they've made. You know, they started here... They couldn't even walk into a shopping centre because they went through a trauma with their, with their parents being moved. Now they can actually go into a shopping centre. And you can look at all the bad behaviours, but look at the distance travelled. And that's, you know, it's about time we, we, we got there. But we're getting there. We're slowly getting there. I think more and more people are realising that the external is not always what it's cracked up to be. You know, it lies to us in many ways, doesn't it, Peter? Mm. Sorry, I didn't mean to take over. No, no, but yeah, I agree. But we still probably look at other people and through their, those. and mm. you know, they everything seems so perfect. Yeah, same so yeah. thing. Go through it, do they? Oh no, mm. go through it. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I can't remember your name. Chris. 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 Yeah, what Chris said spoke to me. Yeah. Um, because that heavy duty and obligation. Yeah. And as. There's so much in this paragraph. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm reading, I'm trying to... And, you know, how we slip unconsciously into our hereditary habits. And I've probably spent the last 40 years trying to work through my heavy dogmas and indoctrination and, yeah. and also how you're supposed to be perfect and, you know, yeah, I don't want that. <laughs> me, me too, that's how I wrote it. Yeah. <laughs> I just... Uh, what, what, but this is part of the fun too. What, like now in my spiritual practice, I like to see how quickly I can catch mm. the fiery men. It, mm. as, as Curtis likes to call it. Oh, it's angry today. How quick can I catch that lower ego that's trying to rise up? Oh, it got the better. I was rude to Renee for at least 30 seconds then until it was like slap. Oh, sorry, darling. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know. Wow, I might have been weeks when I was a younger man, you know what I mean? Now it's only 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it is, it's encouraging, isn't it? You know, we, you know, it, but we will go on working on this for eternity, I promise. It's not going to be boring in the afterlife. You're always going to have lots of newer things to explore and discover. Well, I think it's it, so. the unconscious impediments. Right. We've got the unconscious impediments. Yes. They're, they're the things, and it, uh, you know, like here, you know, as it's saying, it's unconscious because... Yeah, that's the thing. They're so in, in, ingrained. ingrained. They're yeah. so there. You're absolutely right. And day two gives us that space. Mm. That's why I love, you know, Buddhist meditation and stuff. I love it because it's about giving yourself that space. 
You know, Frank, Victor Frankl says it's, it's, a, it's a short moment between action and reaction that's real freedom. But spiritual practice turns that moment into a much bigger space that we can rise up into again and again and again. And I like the analogy of the eagle. You know, it's that big, big picture. When you're in that space with God, you can just see so much more that's going on in your life. What's pulling my string here? What's pressing a button over there? Oh, that person's really enjoying pulling that string, and I've been playing along like a puppet. You know, and it, but that's that power, isn't it? It's the power of getting out of the unconscious and getting into intention, being intentional and self-aware. Thank you so much. Let's, Chris, do you want to... Oh, let, actually, let's... Um, no, no, let's... Um, Jennifer, do you want to read one more paragraph? Oh, no, I okay. was going around. <laughs> <laughs> You're not greedy. Hey, but what think ye? Sacred text calling out to the advancing soul to examine inconsistencies between inward thoughts or feelings and outward thoughts, words and actions. A certain man had two sons. Revelation truth that every soul has an outward person and an inward person. On a historical internal level, this parable speaks of two kinds of people. Those who were considered the people of God, the Jews, those who were Gentiles and considered outside of covenant with the Lord. This external historical parallel helps us to see the heart of God. The Lord is pleased not with outward conformity, where wherein a selfish judgmental heart resides in a religious veil form the second son. Instead, here the heart is viewed as the most important, the first son, for without it, even if there is obedience, it amounts to a deceptive form of corruption. On a deeper level, the Lord needs us to be willing to deal with our two sons, the internal and external self, or the, or the first and second son. When the two become one, transformation is complete. Thoughts on that? Is that? Are we getting a better sense of the parable? It's so easy to literalize the parable, isn't it? But you know, the Lord is so wise because by literal, literalizing it, we can even make parables out of nations. Oh, the Jewish people, they're the ones who do what God says. You Gentiles, you never do what God says. But of course, when you pull away the veil, Oh, it's actually not that way at all. You know, you could be someone who calls yourself a person of God and you're not doing, you're not functioning out of love. And someone over here who doesn't have a, a, a fit of religious training, but they're loving, they're, you know, they're, they're functioning out of what God wanted. So it, it's clever. The Lord is so wise in his parables that they can speak to us on all these different levels. Any other thoughts before we move on? Can you expand to this, uh, the critical fact that the outward man and an inward man? So this is what distinguishes uh, uh, the real spirituality. Yes. We are always, we are always you know, talking about an outward man. Yes. But rarely we look into the inward man. So the, the, between the East and the West, there's a vast difference. The East always looks into the inward man. Right. So the yoga, the, all the practices, they're always directed towards the inside. Yes. So they meditate to look inside. Mm -hmm. We meditate to look outside because we perceive the heaven is up, up above right. and it is beyond our vision. Right. But the East, they don't uh, think in those lines. They think the God is inside, the divine is inside. So deeper and deeper and deeper when you go, you are able to touch upon this uh, uh, unconscious level through your subconscious movement. So you have to go deeper and deeper. That's what all the meditation and yoga, yes. the real yogic practices. That is, yes. union with God can happen through an inward process. Right. Hmm. But there's a the, 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 here's the challenge, and this is the and this is the you know the dichotomy of life. Yeah. They're both right and they're both wrong. Because. You know, even in the Lord's Prayer we say, Thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. 
And notice that in Genesis, when we get into heaven, it's the space between. It's not even the waters above, which make up heaven and the angels and all their very gentle communication with us. But the space between is where we find heaven. Because the challenge that we have right now is not to try and get into heaven. The challenge is, is to bring New Jerusalem down into our midst. So it's, it's about bringing heaven on earth. That's, the real, that's where the two marry and become one. And there's a real danger in some religious practices to escape, to want to escape the world. And yet the world is where transformation really happens, both inwardly and outwardly. And so it's about East and West meeting in the true sense, Dr. Noel. Mm -hmm. But that's New Jerusalem. She's bringing us that wisdom okay. from, she's bringing it down to us. And we see the ancient churches that you're talking about, Hinduism and all those practices, is now meeting the Christian church and we're, we're starting to see New Jerusalem. Oh, okay. So New are you Mary. saying that there's a risk if you get too inward that people are isolating themselves from the world where... Thank you you're for helping me there. Isolating <laughs> yourself exactly from the outside influences. Yeah. So if you're like a, a monk and you're just, you know, off Don't want to totally the separated. That could be his calling. But, but totally separated us, from the world. Yes. Yeah. For most of us, we, we have to be careful that we're not so heavenly minded, we're no earthly good. Mm. Yeah, because that's kind of a waste too, isn't it? So it's about. You know, the, 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 the hero's tales. The ancients had the hero's tale where the, 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 the hero would ascend up into the heavens and get the nectar of the gods. And then do what? Bring it back down for the people. So, but There's that sense of bringing... It's called Jacob's Ladder. In the Old Testament, it's called, you know, you come up Jacob's Ladder and you've got to come back down. Well, this is what I was saying to you the other day, Jane, and, and Dr. Noel reminded me of this then, is our society, in Western society, is so hung up on our physical health that going to debt for a huge home you can't afford but you've got to do that so you're physically healthy your family's physically healthy but what about your inner self so we're dwelling so much on our senses I need this home to be comfortable comfortable you've got to do this you've got to have a nice comfortable car new reliable car da, da, da. but what about my inner self but if we do the other side and we concentrate solely on it in ourselves and nothing else, then we suffer physically. So I think we're, am I making sense? We're missing Chris, out. it reminds me of the American Indians. Is it Navajo or is it but one of them? They say everyone has two wolves inside them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, they fight. It's, depends on which one you feed. Yeah, yeah they yeah. fight. <laughs> uh, and who will win? Yeah. The one you feed. <laughs> so if, if we're concentrating solely on our physical, yeah, uh, physical, we're, we're feeding the wrong wolf. We're feeding too much of the wrong. And you wolf. can see it in society. They go to catch the bus and train. They're, they're so heavily in debt, but their spiritual self, inner self, is suffering so much because their physical self needs to be comfortable. And you can see it. My, as long as I'm, as long as I'm happy physically, that's all this life's about. And that's where we're going wrong. Mental illness. Every you can't go anywhere without seeing mental illness. I mean, we're not living to our design. We're concentrating solely on that physical health. And, and we're is, suffering. And this is where day three comes into it, right? Because we get the enlightenment, but then we've got to go back, because you should. It's godly and right and charitable to provide for your family. But it, it, it shouldn't take over. Isn't it an interesting word? What, you know, ego is all about ownership, right? And what do we call the things that we own? Possessions. Because? They possess us. Wow. Yeah, isn't that powerful? Yeah. Wow. Possession. But you see, so this is why before enlightenment you chop wood and carry water. But after enlightenment, you still chop wood and carry water. You've got a duty to do. But no longer are you doing it just because you're driven by whatever. You're free. And now there can be a marriage between the external world and the internal world. You can now when you carry wood and, and chop uh, sorry, chop wood and carry water uh, as an enlightened person. There is a vibration of love that's unperceivable to the unenlightened, but it's still there. And isn't that that's what it's about? Is is new earth, day three, is about re-engaging now. So I've had light, I've worked with it, I've, I've detached my ego and, and, and analyzed myself and seen how these things are working in me, the, the fiery men with this thing. And now I'm going to go back to work. But I take that with me. So, this, so, so that's day three. So we're, we're, we're jumping ahead to the parables we're going to do months 
months to come, but, but you're getting a sense of what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So will God call a monk just to, I mean, he might call somebody, yeah, to separate from the world, to work on things, but would he call that person for them to indefinitely separate from the world there and is, be in that space forever? There, like, is a, there is a time where the disciples came to Jesus and they talked about getting married and all the challenges that caused because some of the disciples were married. And Jesus, you know, and, and they said, you know, well, Jesus said, well, whatever you give up for the kingdom of heaven, you'll receive up. Again, houses, why, and a wife, you know, over and over abundantly. And the disciples said, well, we've given up everything. What will we receive? And, and the Lord said, you'll receive much. Um, you'll sit on thrones with you and all that sort of stuff. But then he went on to say that being called into that kind of a calling, which he says is called being called a eunuch, or having to live a celibate life, is not for everyone. In fact, it's for very few people. It's only for those who are called. Because heaven's got to be filled some way. If we all become a eunuch, you're not going to fill heaven, are you, with, yeah. with new souls? So it's, it's, it's really about the calling and having peace. And if you can be at peace, being celibate and single, then I would say that you've been given that gift and you could use... I mean, Swedenborg himself spent the, the latter part of his life he wanted to be married, but he gave that up because that gave him so much more time and freedom to, to travel. I mean, literally travel in the spiritual world and write down and document everything that he saw. So what if they're totally separated from the world? Like, if you're living in some remote mountain ministry that's separated from everybody else, uh -huh. I mean, if there's other monks there, you can be serving your brothers there. Yes. It, like, is that your call? Like... It would seem so, wouldn't it? It would seem to... I, I think the Lord will work it out for good, I'm sure. Because he's not calling you to just totally isolate yourself from no. everything. There is more I can tell you about it, maybe. Yeah, yeah, would that's like cool. It's yeah, a great question. Yeah. I think the Swedenborg says, you know, the users of man, the users, yeah. are the reflections of the divine love. Right. So the monks are in a way hypocrites, in the sense, they go isolate themselves, sit on a mountain, think about it, pray about it. For what? If you, if you do not know how to love your neighbor and do something to that neighbor, what are we talking about love and uh, spirituality? So these segregation... I feel better, Dr. Hypocrites, than I joined the Buddha. I'm a hypocrite. Now, you're right. It is a journey. And I would say those people who are on that journey are learning mm -hmm. in that journey. And just as I'm learning on my journey, Lord, may we all discover our hypocrisy and, and, and become better men and women. As we, but, but there's an element of truth in what you're yeah, saying. Um, it's about calling, and some, some of these monks have written great works that have influenced lives. And, you know, it's about use. So they're gurus and uh, teachers uh, for the others to, to learn. Yes. Yes. So that may be their objective, mm. sure, right? Yeah. So that truth will be well expressed rather yeah. than another, other human beings. What yeah. we mustn't do is run from who we are, though. I mean, if you... I, I will say this, and I say this very lovingly. If you want to be a man of God in the Catholic You've got no option but to become a priest, which means you cannot marry. Now, you want to be sure that's your calling, because if you are suppressing something that God's called you to be married, it, those kind of distortions take form somewhere else. Mm. Okay, and so it is about not, you know, be, you know, I would find it so challenging if I wanted to be a man of God and I was a Catholic. It's like I love having a wife and a family. That's, you know. Yeah, but they transmute the energy to a spiritual energy. If you've got that gift. Yeah, if so then, it, then it, it becomes compensated. Yes. If you don't transmute that energy to the spiritual energy, then you are a human being. So that's where, you know, the, all these monks, some of them are so powerful because the love is transcended Beautiful. to yeah, your transmutation. And they, so the, the light can be seen through them. Yes. So then they become the, the light of the world. But otherwise, the labels like monks and priests and all that, you know, if they are physically bound, I think you know, they're as good as we. So, so they know how to separate themselves. But persons like Mother Teresa is one such example where she didn't marry, never married, didn't have a boyfriend, didn't have associate her, but then she transferred everything into love. Yeah. The way she loved is unbelievable. A human <laughs> being cannot do that work. I have seen, I have gone to Calcutta, seen her work, and it is, it is not possible for a human being to do that. So that. That is related to a monk who can be a specialist. 
in loving, mm -hmm. was advising. A calling. But where can we find that monk is the problem. Well, it's a calling. And again, if we all do it, there'll yes. be no tomorrow. <laughs> but, yeah. and, and I've learned this too. Um, never covet another person's calling. Be you. Be, be who you are. If you're called yeah. to be a monk, then be it. Yeah. Never covet another person's calling because it's not, you'll never be happy in that. But sometimes we can think, am I missing out? Am I not being everything I'm meant to be? But this is where the message of heaven and earth marrying is free. If you're called to be a mechanic, be the best loving mechanic you can. Whatever you're called to do, do it under the law. So it's, yeah. Well, look, we. how would people feel if we if we continue this next month? We, I think this might be a two-parter because it's <coughs> there's so much stuff coming out and I don't want to rush through simply just for the sake of, of, of fishing. Would, would people be happy with that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now you can take them, these are for you to keep. You want to take them home or you can leave them here and we'll make a pile so we don't lose them next month. Let's leave it here. Leave it here? <laughs> I like Chris Asia. I'll pick it up. I'll pick it up right where I left it. <laughs> so people will go home and study it. And <laughs> that's great too. Whatever your, whatever your heart's content is. Is there any final thoughts, comments? Yeah. Joy, how are you? you, would you was it working? Can you, can you connect with what's happening here? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, it's all about self-consciousness. <coughs> Self-awareness? Self-awareness. But yeah. using sacred text as a mirror. Mm. And, and, and not, not a lens to judge everyone else, no. but, but a mirror. Yeah. And that every word, mm. that every line contains great treasures. It's yeah. really good to slow down and just True. look at these. Yeah, and, and, and this is where we go through a process. Go, go through these parables with us. You'll be a master at the word. You, it sense will open up to you. You'll be reading a story and going, ah, I see a, I see a message here that I never saw before. Yeah, true. Yeah. That, no, not all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, you know, like Dr. Mel said, like some people are so absorbed and they give their power away that they don't realize the kingdom of God's inside. And then other people are so externally focused so what's the balance like paul the apostle said i don't search my own heart i allow the holy spirit if he's putting his finger on something then i go inside so i believe all of this should a person be a monk should they be in the city on the hill down it's it's a relationship being led by the spirit otherwise we fall into the danger of the tree of good and evil in the garden which was still death like there's good principles i go inside myself i serve but if that's not coming out of the tree of life being spirit-led, then they're both death. They're just principles we're trying to do rather than being led in a relationship, whether I'm on the mountain, whether I'm in the valley. This is so powerful what you're saying, Chris, because this is what day one is. And we did that last year, and, and we went months going through all the parables. Day one, understanding these moments of enlightenment. You had a, you know, you had a real moment of something speaking to you in a new way. That is how the Holy Spirit leads us. And we don't have to... Um, you know, every truth that's lying around you that you hear, you don't have to pick it up. It's the ones that glow. That's the Holy Spirit saying, hey, come over here for a moment. Focus on this truth. I have, you know, something to show you. But, but this is also really important because I've seen it so often. It's seven days of spiritual <coughs> work that make us come into the rest. Too often we'll just focus in on one spirit, you know, like day two about learning to detach from the ego. That's a very important step, but it's not enough. Or, or, or we're just all about gathering light. You get these hungry people that just, give me more light, give me more light, give me more light. And it's great. But you've got to learn to process that or you become an even worse hypocrite because you've been given much and done nothing. So it's about these seven days. And be, be reassured, as we work through the parables, it all comes together. That big picture comes together. And you go, oh, I'm glad he's in charge and not me. That's all I could say. <laughs> what also can be related to this, what yeah. you're saying is, yeah. I learned a lot myself. I learned so much was not feeding pearls to swine. Right. No, no, in me, the swine in me. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, go on. It's, it's, it's going to, parables help us, for me personally, yeah, yeah, yeah. they help me stop feeding pearls to swine. Right. Because I'm, giving all my goodness to someone <coughs> that doesn't really treasure it, but you give it to them in what keeps like filth. So you, you speak the Fertilizer. parable. Manure and fertilizer. That's a nice way of saying it. <laughs> so we can give them their pearls and their food. Right. This is the, the magic of parables. 
terrible, I was going to say, have helped release so many people. But I don't say it in text. I say it in... What? I, I dirty the... I dirty the uh, Chris, what you do, and, and this is what's supposed to happen, and, and what Chris does, is if we talk to someone, and he'll just have a little story pop in his head. And, that, and it's like, I guess you're not necessarily quoting a direct parallel. No. But you say, let me tell you this little story. And bang, it does it, doesn't it? And they go, wow. Cool. Yeah, well, yeah. That's a good way of saying it. I was just thinking, that's something out of the script that you can't tell them, right? No. So the way I say is, I'm getting that pearl, right. throwing it in mud, handing it to them. They'll eventually be able to clear the mud off the pearl and be able to use that pearl one day. That's no, no, it's good. I, I like, I like what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it is in, in the new church. We make a very strong distinction between goodness, the pearl, and truth, the oyster. That's protecting that pearl. You know, truth isn't so pleasant. It's not always. In fact, I would say, truth is all about, you know, an encounter with death. It, tr truth is very destructive. Before you come through the false, you know, the ego, the lower ego, into the higher self. It's very destructive because all those uh, uh, unconscious things that you were talking about have got to break down, haven't they? They've got to break down. That's a very destructive process. And some people don't like truth, but they always like the goodness. But you can't give them the goodness straight away because they'll crush it. So you're learning to, what you're learning to do is take that goodness and put it into a truth form that they'll digest. And it's, yeah. it's quite powerful. Very powerful. <coughs> it's the way it's meant to be. Mm -hmm. Jesus would not speak to people but in parables. All at a family gathering, and my auntie will be, she will get on a soapbox and all <laughs> literal like, she's she pent up right? and across yeah. the world, <laughs> and she will do all this, and the whole family's like, I love it. And it's just my mum's favourite song is uh, George Harrison's Sweet Lord, and my mum's not a Christian, but I said, Mum, Sweet Lord, that's your song, and my auntie says, That's not a Christian song, it's not what you think it is, <laughs> and um, everyone was watching, and I said, but, Linda, this is about divine love, about love that everyone can understand, not just in your taste. And I'll put it in forms of, I love hot, hot curry. That person likes mild curry. That person doesn't like curry at all. But if we put in divine light, that's food. It's not curry at all, it's food. Think, think, how, sense? think how the Lord must feel, Chris. He's going to come to the Baptist in a Baptist form. He's going to come to the, uh, the Pentecostal in a Pentecostal form. He comes to us in how we can receive it. And then he'll go out to other religions and go to them in forms that they can receive as well. In forms of food. 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 In has a relationship with the divine, just like we have a relationship with music and food. I guarantee we are all different, but it's all music for food. Yeah, it? yeah. And it's all, it, 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 it's food for our soul, it's food for our physical being. And that's how I explain spirituality to people. I've had people say, so you, you dislike gay people, you're homophobic, you're this, 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 I'm a Christian, but everyone's different. Now, I use the hot curry term a lot. You like curry? Oh, I can't stand that. Oh, I love hot curry. So, you know what I mean? It's a great way to explain it because that's something we're all so different about. We're yes. all so different. And the divine works the same. Let's finish with one last scripture <laughs> because it's such good stuff you're saying. Let's finish with one last scripture. Now, this is why scripture is so powerful. It gives you encounters with the divine. It's, it says in Isaiah, A bruised reed he will not break. And a smoking flax, like the candle, because that one's gone out nearly. A smoking flax he will not snuff out. Right? And what that means, in the spiritual sense, the bruise reed is what, the bruise reed is when our will is bending towards something it shouldn't be. Right? It, it, it's, the, the Lord won't just go, oh, it's bending over, let's snap it off. A bruise reed he will not break. He works with us. If we're bending a certain way, he'll work with us until we can become strong again. Or a smoking flax, so the light's almost gone out, but there's a little bit of spark, the Lord doesn't snuff it out. If we're having a, a half understanding, if, if a person's kind of halfway there, the Lord will just breathe on it and work with it and not snuff it out. So it, 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 this is who we love and serve. He's, he's working with what we give him. All of us, the whole human race. Yeah, beautiful stuff. Shall we, any, any final thoughts that we'll pray? No? Just after me, just say, dear Lord.
saying to me you, you just have to love him like because we missed like years missed out you know he's 18 now four years he was out in the streets juvie you know not living with me so it's catching up and it's like that lord saying you just got to serve him mm. and love him and things aren't going to be perfect and it's going to stretch and you're going to need my love so you don't get triggered and you guys don't get you know and so Fantastic. It's working, it's working, there's things, you know, I've had to, like, it's almost like what I said, when he does it, when he's not, like, for instance, I said, can you clean up after yourself, you know, and he doesn't, the ego can, can get hurt, you know, you're disrespecting me, man, that's, you know, but for what Lord said, reframe it, etc. when he does that, you clean him up after him. you don't nag him and you do it as worship to me and you pray for him. Right. right. He will change. Right. He will change. And so yeah. you know, I'm doing that and so my ego is dying that mm. part of it's offended and so yeah. you know, all that sort of thing. And he's changing. He is like the other day. You know, he's he got, I came home yesterday and he's watching a last an end day's production thing that I posted on Pip the Pip report like and he said to me on Saturday and I said that another young guy got baptized. Then when he said Dad, should I get baptized? No, the Lord's working in him, you can see he's just but it's the love that's breaking down. No, because he just sees I just keep coming back to him even keep loving him even when he's disrespectful and you know, we're getting help with Darren, trying to maybe talk with Darren every week. So yeah, he's yeah, getting there, you know. Yeah. Like, he's still like, okay. he's smoking pot. He's even dealing with marijuana. Mm. Like, but this is the thing I asked him when he came here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, no, I'm not dealing. I knew he was dealing. The Lord showed me. And, so, and then one night, there's not going to do No, the door was open and a guy walks in and they do a deal in front of me like, yeah. And the Lord showed it purposely. Yeah. And Levi said, What are you doing here? Not meant to be here. And the Lord did it purposely, so I'd see it. And I said to Levi, Look, I just want you to be honest, man. So you don't have to lie to me. Like, I'm not going to. He says, Because I thought I'd get kicked out. I said, I'm not going to kick you out. I said, What the Lord showed me is you don't think you're hurting anyone. They're going to buy it anyway. It's legal now. You're trying to be an entrepreneur, make money. And, and, and the Lord showed me, He's like, The way He sees it, it's like, zombie apocalypse and there's a guy just trying to make a living you know everything's gone crazy and he's just trying to make a living and so he lord helped me to understand where he was at i said i don't, I don't believe you believe you're hurting anyone but i believe the lord wants to show you a higher vision of yourself yeah and 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 i don't see the thank you Juan. thank you so much Thank <laughs> you. 